During the Great Famine, New Orleans was the second largest port in the nation, a cosmopolitan city with historical ties to Ireland dating back to its colonial days. In the mass exodus from Ireland, immigrants poured into the city, and by 1860, one out of every five residents was Irish. The Irish were drawn to the city by its dominant Catholicism and lack of quarantine facilities as well as access to the heartland via the Mississippi River. They booked steerage passage on freight vessels that carried cotton and other raw goods to England and passengers on the return trip to New Orleans. Emigration was not an easy choice for those people who came. And many people, in fact, died. We think about 5%, 5 to 10% of people died on what was later called the coffin ships. Even if people got to America, we know that their health was badly affected by all the privations they'd been through. Um, some research suggests that when people got to America, their average lifespan was only six years. Passengers were crammed into the cargo holes of ships where they endured storms and seasickness, plus food and water shortages. Despite laws regulating passenger ships, conditions worsened during the famine and the Irish traveled at great peril. The day after Christmas in 1850, the ship Eudocia leaves Liverpool with 412 passengers, 400 of whom are Irish. And there are dozens of people on board who are already sick, and typhus infects them as they cross the North Atlantic. And they are on board ship for 56 days in dank, dark, foul, smelly areas of the ship. When they are finally arrive at the mouth of the Mississippi in February of 1851, they disembark on the landing between Clowett and Montague Street, still exist in New Orleans, and is far down in what was then the third municipality. The captain reports that there are 12 people who have died. In fact, there are 14. They walk the blocks and blocks to get to Charity Hospital, where 67 of these people are, will be admitted to Charity Hospital within the next half hour. Six of the people who are admitted of the 67 will die within the next two days. The newly arrived Irish paid a head tax to support the indigent hospital that was founded in 1736. Staffed by the Sisters of Charity, after 1848, the hospital's patients were predominantly Irish. The charity hospital admission records tell the story and that the Irish predominate the admissions. The afflictions that they have are the ones that should tell us something about the social conditions of New Orleans. Typhus, fever, uh, tuberculosis. The, these are diseases that are environmental, and so they're living in an environmental death trap. But if you look at the charity hospital employment list, you'll see name after name after name that Irish. The Irish discovered a wealth of employment opportunities in the emerging urban center. By 1850, they dominated the police force and were the backbone of the port. This is the era of King Cotton. It's the era of steamboats and New Orleans was growing rapidly. And the Irish come here, like many immigrants, one of your first priorities is economic opportunity, looking for a job. And so you go where there is that opportunity, and New Orleans offered it in spades. And so they come in and they take over quickly, for example, the draymen. The draymen take, literally, they, they take goods from the port to a warehouse, to a business, and back again. They are the transportation network that makes sure that those goods come in. The economic opportunity obviously was there and recognized by the Irish because not only do the Irish come in and take over the draymen positions, but you'll see where one particular Irish man will have 12 licenses. Famine immigrants were instrumental in founding organizations that protected their interests in the city, like the overwhelmingly Irish Screwman's Benevolent Association. The Screwman, those men whose job it was to take cotton bales and to screw them so tight 
so you can compress them down and put them into the steamboats. They form the Benevolent Society and they provide benefits for their members. So you have all the hallmarks of a union, but they're not called a union. The popularity of Irish domestics in the American sector encouraged the immigration of young Irish women. This time in antebellum America, and New Orleans was no exception to this, uh, there was a high demand for domestic servants. Going back to Ireland and looking at our famine immigrants, you have to think about what it took and the cost that it took to come over. And a lot of times, for many families, they couldn't afford to come over as an entire family. So they knew if they sent their daughter over, chances are she'd walk off the boat and into a job very quickly. Domestic servants, they had their food paid for, their clothing paid for, their housing paid for. All the basic necessities are part of the job, which meant that your wages was basically lanyard. And so Irish women send the money back home and they begin that process of chain migration. Irish immigrant Margaret Hawhery embodied Irish entrepreneurship and community spirit. With her meager savings, the St. Charles Hotel Laundress bought two cows to provide milk for children under the care of the Sisters of Charity. Within two years, she had a successful dairy and later became owner of the first steam bakery in the South. Until her death, she provided fresh bread for the city's orphans and poor. What makes Margaret's story even more amazing, because it is an amazing story, is the fact that she was illiterate and she manages these enterprises, she grows them, they become successful, and yet she signs her name with an X. For many Irish immigrants, New Orleans was the gateway to the nation's interior, those who stayed settled in cohesive communities scattered throughout the city. Of the 104,000 Irish who arrived between 1847 and 1852, only a few thousand stay. The evidence of their staying is by the institutions that they found. The church, schools, orphanages, political organizations, benevolent associations that they have here in New Orleans. Desiring a church where God spoke English, Irish Catholics who lived in the Faubourg St. Mary above Canal Street established St. Patrick's Parish in 1833. An impressive Gothic Revival church was completed between Camp and Gerard Street in 1840. St. Patrick's is located in our current downtown area, our central business district, so it's not very far from Canal Street. We see it at the beginning of the American sector. And as the immigrants come in, in particular that tidal wave of famine immigrants that come in, they're following the river up, and they're following it, and they're building churches. Um, in quick succession. And in fact, New Orleans' golden age of church building occurs in that last sort of decade, 15 years before the Civil War. And the Irish are in large part responsible for it. If you want to know where the Irish settled in New Orleans, look where the churches are. In the church that we're in here now, St. Alphonsus, this parish got started in 1849. And it actually went through several building phases, and this one they built and started in 1855. And when you look around and you see how beautiful this church is, it's large, it's welcoming, and it is built by these famine immigrants. It, they literally, with their pennies, with their own sweat, with their time and energy, they created this magnificent edifice. And they do it both for themselves, for the glory of God, but also to the outside world to say, this is what we can achieve, this is what's important to us. In 1853, the city experienced its worst yellow fever epidemic. An estimated 9,000 New Orleanians died, and the Irish suffered the greatest mortality rate. Civic leaders blamed the spread of yellow jack on the immigrants, and it was referred to as a stranger's disease. The newspapers are, are replete with talk of the strangers, those who are unacclimated, uh, those that are subject to the disease uh, because of their, their alien nature, their inability or unwillingness to live prudently. It's a medical know-nothingism that runs amok. The prejudice against the Irish followed them to the city. 
where the anti-immigration know-nothing movement labeled them as papists and foreign paupers. The know-nothings become very influential in the mid-1850s and all the way through to the time of secession. Uh, Know-nothingism is very strong in the city of New Orleans. But the Irish who come here, if you, if you look at the census data and you look at the city directories and, and particularly you look at succession records and wills, you find out that these people are anything but disillusioned, degraded and demoralized. They have a resolve and a resiliency that is remarkable. Although Irish immigration trickled off after the Civil War, the Irish of New Orleans maintained a strong cultural identity through organizations like the Ancient Order of Hibernians and through that exuberant expression of ethnic pride, St. Patrick's Day, which has been celebrated in the city for over 200 years. What they bring with them is not only their clothes on their backs, but their culture as well. And they build lives of substance and consequence, marry, have children, have grandchildren, have weddings, have funerals. And that's what they do. And their cultural experience in Ireland, they've brought here. <laughs>